All right, welcome to Utah Family Law. Today we're here with Mary Beth and Jim. Why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? Um, my name, I'm Jim. Oh, I'm Mary Beth, and I'm a, a, a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous with a sobriety date of 7-22-1993. And I uh, got sober in St. Louis, Missouri, and currently live in uh, Kanab, Utah. And I've been in Kanab um, since... Uh, Probably about 15, 2015, we've owned our house here in eight, and since 08. Uh, I'm an active member of the Kanab um, community and an active member of uh, my home group is the Altered Attitudes Group in uh, Kanab, Utah. And I am the secretary for District 7, which is part of the entire state of Area 69 AA of Utah. Uh, we're one big area. It's Area 69. And currently, I am the public information chair for the state of Utah. For Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so today we want to talk about alcohol and drugs and how that impacts families and relationships. So I wanted to go off with my first question about how does alcohol and drugs impact somebody's life? I know that's a pretty broad question, but what are some things that come to mind? If, if, if you have alcoholism, it, it takes over your life. Uh, and, and most of the time you're not even aware that that's happened. Um, it, it pretty much dictated before I got sober, it pretty much dictated what I did, who I hang, hung out with, um, what outside activities I did, uh, just pretty much everything. Alcohol, for me, this is Mary Beth, alcohol for me just like reminds me that the levels the playing field, but I was thought I was uh, too right, white, too, had, too much money, had my own house, had my own car, I had a great education, had I was pursuing a master's and I didn't think that I would be uh, alcoholic, but it impacted every part of my protoplasm, every little gene I had in me and, you know, family relationships, work relationships, uh, wh where I ate, when I went out to dinner, whether they had alcohol available on Sunday in the city I lived in, all, all kind of things. So you don't, I, I didn't, and I would never have admitted this in 1993, 92, 91, or 89, any of that, that alcoholism was such a prominent part of my life. I would have denied it to my poor. I denied it with my parents, my uh, separate conversations with my, my parents and, and my, and my siblings. So in, when, when, I have when one has alcoholism it's just not my alcoholism it permeates into the family my uh, relationship with m my siblings relationship with the people with whom I was dating it and it's uh, so much of it is all the selfishness and self-centeredness that I projected and would never have admitted that I had um, that I was selfish and self-centered and just thought the whole world revolved around me and that wasn't a you know, and alcoholism is a is a disease that um, is a is a coded in a in a medical profession so that you can one can get treatment for alcoholism. But and I was a nurse educated in college and didn't think I had any kind of problem. So it is um, just what was right in my face until I got called on the carpet by a boss. So that's that's how I ended up in alcohol Al alcoholics anonymous. But it. It impacts it impacts your life with finances. It impacts your life emotionally. It impacts all parts of your life. And one can be alcoholic for a long, long time and not even think anything was wrong with their. I I, I was alcoholic for for at least fifteen years and didn't think there was anything wrong with my life. That, that reminds me of a different question that I didn't pose to you earlier. But when do you think people realize or do they ever really realize that they have um a problem or do people realize they have a problem around them before the individual themselves realize they have an issue probably can be both ways um i i knew when i was 16 years old that i didn't drink like other people uh, didn't pay much attention to it, recognize the fact that other people didn't drink the way i drank uh, and so and then and then going on through So you need to get away from the drugs and the people were doing that was a big thing for me and and i you know we grew up in the 60s so the drugs were very prevalent and, and common um 
but that that was a, that was kind of the thing I heard over and over and over again that you know you need to get away from the drugs and the people are doing them or the people that you're hanging around with that kind of thing. Drinking because it was legal was never a big issue or never was brought to light a whole lot until later on. So early, probably up to in my 30s, drinking was even though even though it was a major problem, nobody was saying anything about it. Uh, they had just kind of accepted the fact, I guess, that I, that's the way I was. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think a few times people would say something about you're drinking too much or that kind of a, a, a statement, but nothing, nothing really, uh, nothing real pushy. So. I, denial is it was part of was part of my part of my life, and it's you know as we say in the big book, cunning, baffling, and powerful. And I did, just didn't think I had a problem with alcohol uh, well um, as I alluded to my my father had a separate conversation with me my mother would follow me home after I would go to their house on Sunday and make sure I got home okay and I was uh, that was uh, I was unaware that she was even following me home to my own house um, I had a boss what happened to me was I was in uh, upper management in, in a nursing uh, hospital and uh, my boss called me on the carpet and said you have a uh, an appointment at a certain time on a on two on a Tuesday, and uh, uh, she called me into the office. And one never gets called into the ninth floor where I worked unless there was a problem. And I can remember standing looking out the window and thought, well, may, and she asked me what what's going on. And I what, what I was calling into the hospital uh, during my. Uh, Two and two and three in the morning, making sure that the people that were responsible to me um, were being uh, reassigned appropriately with an on-site supervisor. So it was just so inappropriate. I mean, my my um, my reports were late. All kind of things were it, my. I wasn't paying my bills. I had plenty of money. My bills weren't being paid. I was back. I was I owed federal taxes. I worked for the federal government, and I, I wasn't even paying my my taxes. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. So um, my family was aware of it and the folks with whom I was, uh, I was working, I was counting narcotics. And once one of the uh, LPNs, I'm a, uh, was a bachelor's nurse. Um, one of the LPNs said, well, I smell alcohol in your breath as, as I was counting narcotics. So, I mean, I was, I, I was just, Den I just denied everything, and it, denial is the worst thing an alcoholic or drug, a drug addict can have. It, even if it hits you in the face, I was I had a DWI three years or four years before I, I went into uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. I had just too much diet uh, orange soda in the, my backyard with vodka in it uh, to admit that, yeah, I was drinking a little bit. So it it was... Cunning, baffling, and powerful, as we say. No. Do people who struggle with an addiction, do they see how they're hurting the people around them? Or are they really focused on getting that next fix or getting that next drink that they can't even see the impact they're having on their family and relationships? I, um, I knew my parents were concerned. I had had a couple of folks that I was dating that had mentioned uh, about uh, smelling like alcohol prior to picking me up and going out on a date. I, I, I heard those words. I knew my, my parents were trying to help me and were concerned. I was completely intoxicated from my younger brother's wedding. Uh, I, will, I, will, I won't forget that moment in my life. Um, I, and I knew my sister and her husband who lived out of town were, were very concerned too, but I just, I, I guess I just couldn't get there. I, cause I, again, I thought I, I, I didn't have a problem. Uh, so it, it, does that answer? I don't think that might answer the question. No, it does. Yeah. You're, you didn't think you had a problem. So you couldn't see how, what you're doing was hurting others. Cause you had, you know, blinders and, and up saying. Just, yeah. Not just hurting others, but it impacts it just, can destroy relationships or cause so much worry and pain and for other people. So that's where the 12 steps of alcoholics and that has come into play. And one gets to make amends to one's parents. You going to respond to Yeah, I think, I think that I really believe that um, when you're in the middle of it, you know, you know, you're hurting other people, but, but at the same time, um, 
one, the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous is that you admit you're powerless. And I think the, the, the recognition of being powerless is not there yet. Um, so everything, everything about alcoholism and drug use is, is dominating your life. You don't really have any power to stop it. Uh, I know there were times that when I, I knew I was hurting people, but just couldn't seem to not hurt them. Just couldn't seem to stop doing what I was doing. Um, so it, that's kind of where it takes you. Yeah, and when you look back at it, it, it's it's hard to imagine that I didn't see I had a drinking problem, but there were so many boxes that I I checked and, and was unaware of it. And I, I, you know, I always thought I didn't hit any of the yet yet. I, I I so many of the yes, like I I still had a job. I was I thought I was paying my bills, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, all I was doing was just lowering my standards, particularly working in a profession like nursing, which is all I wanted to do my entire life. I mean, I was a candy striper, and I knew I wanted to be a nurse. So it was it was everything for me, and I loved nursing. Um, so it's it's it just overtakes you. It overtook my entire life, my brain, and everything. And then have you seen for people, maybe in your cases as well, like when you do notice on the occasion that you are hurting other people, did that, does that make people drink even more because they feel bad for hurting people because they were drinking? Does it just deepen the cycle? You got that one? Probably, probably so. I mean, there's always, there's a lot of guilt with it because you know, you're doing this to other people, but you can't seem to stop. Uh, and so uh, and whether or not, I mean, you you can only drink as much as you drink, and you can only do so much drugs. But but um, I don't think it. I don't really think it drives you any deeper into it because you're already there as far as you can go already. Uh, if that makes sense, yeah. uh, I just think that. The, but you carry the guilt with you that you're doing it because you know you're hurting other people, and yet you can't seem to stop. And and that's kind of where, uh, kind of where you go. Can't seem to stop, and you don't want to stop. And yeah, the guilt is right there and it was right there in my face and in my life but uh, and I like I said and I was in the health profession so that was probably the second boss I had that um actually can I, I, I don't strong I don't use the word confront very often uh, but she pretty much confronted me because I I still can remember when she said I said well what am I supposed to do now uh after I said I probably have a problem with drinking and she said well you can't uh, you can't work here until you get your problem fixed. So that's how I ended up in treatment. I didn't want to lose my job and I did. I love nursing. So that's what, but it wasn't until I got hit practically on the head with a big brick. And I, then my life just kind of like dissolved everything. It was just, I mean, I finally admitted it was all falling apart. And I, it, so it just overtakes you. Alcoholism and drug addiction did. What is something you wish more people knew about recovery? It's free, really. Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to pay a dime to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. There are Alcoholics Anonymous meetings all over Utah, all over the United States. We know that we travel frequently out of state, and we come. We both got sober in a large city where there are at least nine hundred meetings a day or a week. So, I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous is available, and we are no judge zone. We'll, we'll, you'll come into a meeting, and we won't judge you if you've been, if this is your 15,000th time trying to get sober. Just come on in and sit in the chair. And if you don't want to share, you don't have to share. But we are here for you, and we know what it's like to try to get sober, and we know what it's like to try to get sober and not get sober. So the doors, we don't worry about the revolving door. We don't worry about whether you have a job, whether you have a sponsor, just come on in and sit down and stay and we'll be glad to help you. It's a life-changing event, and but we know where you're coming from. We really do. Jim? I think, um, I, I wish, I wish, well, I don't know how many people know, but if more people knew that, uh, recovery is not about treatment. Uh, it's not about um, white knuckling it, not drinking, not doing drugs, just, just grinding through. Uh, it's not about any of that. It's about whether or not 
your life has gotten to the point where you want to change. Uh, it has to be from in, within an individual. Um, no one else can fix that. Uh, we have a we have a series of actions you can take that will correct that and help you live a really good life. But we can't make you do that. And it has to be something your own self initiative really uh, to do that. Uh, and I don't know that a lot of people know that. I think a lot of people think they go to treatment, and the the word kind of implies that once you finish, finish treatment, you should be okay. And uh, and that's not reality. Reality is that if you have alcoholism or drug addiction, you're never going to be okay until you until you address your alcoholism and your drug addiction, uh, because it doesn't go away. The, uh... the Alcoholics Anonymous has been in existence for more than 80 years, and it's helped millions of people recover from alcoholism. And it happens every day. And I can't remember how many countries, but it, it, it's there. And as Jim alluded to, the, the, 12, the, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are actions, as Jim mentioned, that we have that we should take, but it's up to the individual. But there, there, there are no actions that are going to make you hurt yourself or be ashamed. I mean, or be ashamed. We're, we're, we're there. You can come in and uh, take the actions uh, with with a sponsor, and we encourage sponsors to to help take them through to help take me through the steps. Um, it's a, it's a simple program, but we complicate it because we're human beings. But it's it's available twenty four seven. Throughout the uh, you know the United States, we have one of the strongest Alcoholics Anonymous programs in the United States, uh, and it's easy to find AA these days because we have it electronically on on our phones, and it's called the Chair app. So it's re readily available for folks, uh, even when when one is traveling. We we in Canab we were able to keep our meetings face to face with bass during COVID, but we were outside. But that's because I worked with uh, the, the Kane County attorney who said yes. He gave me the suggestions what I needed to do, and we took them and we st we stayed open during COVID. We were one of the few places in Utah with that ability, but it it's a remarkable program. But it does take some action on the alcoholics' part. Nothing that none of us haven't done. Uh, already done and we're there to support the folks okay and you said the app was called the chair app mm -hmm. yes it's okay. called the chair app. I'll, I'll put a link of that in the description um and then how can we help someone who is in recovery without it impacting ourselves or becoming an enabler um I, 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 <laughs> If you've been so uh, after you've been sober for a while, you start almost to the point of becoming cynical um, because there's so many people that come, stay a week, stay a month, whatever, and then go back and, and go back to using again. And we see a lot of I've saw a lot of people die, uh, overdose, suicides, whatever. Um, so you, you kind of almost build a, a, a barrier around yourself. It, it's hard not to be. Um, we're very cynical, really, uh, because you, you understand how difficult it is to do. Um, but at the same time, you can also learn how to set boundaries on where what you uh, will do and won't do. Um, most of the time, uh, at least for myself and Mary Beth, we both have sponsors uh, who are people that have been sober longer than we have, who have gone through the process before, who have good lives or, or living good lives or, you know, good citizens and everything else. And, and so they're kind of mentors in a, in a big degree. Um, we still have those today. Uh, it doesn't stop. I, I need somebody that I'm accountable to um, because if I'm on my own, I, I do things the way I want to do them. And, and really the, the main problem, I, I, I believe anyhow, is that um, the problem of alcoholism is, is selfishness and self-centeredness to the nth degree, um, much more so than most people. And so if I, if that's all, I, if I have somebody that I'm accountable to, then I tend to act better than I than, than I really feel act better than I really want to sometimes um, because I know I'm going to have to report to that person how I'm behaving and, and get, you know, that never got, have got, never gotten chewed out, but I always expect that anyhow. Um, That's good. I think Jim covered it. Sponsorship is, is, is significantly important. And I, I, I do have a sponsor that sometimes sponsorship isn't, 
and this is my personal opinion, isn't stressed enough in, uh, uh, and it, it helped, certainly, I, and I sponsor women here in Canab, and uh, we're, we're working through the 12 steps and the 12 traditions and 12 concepts together. So it, it's, it's, it's a way I grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And Jim's been sober 30 years and I've been sober 29 years and it, it, it still works many, many years later. Uh, so it's just really uh, 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 unconditional love one has for another person in, in, in uh, other folks, women in my life, but I'm able to um, somehow say, you know, this isn't going to work. Or can, can, can I give you a suggestion uh, for, you know, I can give you an example of how it, 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 it's not enabling, but I do uh, part of my selfishness and self-centeredness tells me that I need to think less of Mary Beth and more of you. So I, in order for me to fall in love with the Alcoholics Anonymous program in the small town of Kanab, Utah, I, uh, uh, signed up for a lot of community service and um, consequently the folks that I sponsor are getting involved in community service and uh, I have a, one individual who is just fearful of human beings and doesn't want to interact and doesn't want to talk but uh, she's um, coming into her, her own and is able to come to um, community events and, and help with community events in it in you know, it, it certainly helps her self-esteem and her ability to interact with people. So um, people don't watch what we say, they watch what we do. And I, I say that all the time to the, to the, to the folks in my, meet, in my home group and in the folks that I sponsor. People really don't, it's, it's, it's not what I say in the rooms and where the rubber hits the road. It's what, what, how do I respond to community, at a community events and how do I support the community? Because if we didn't have a, a town of Kanab and if we didn't have a, uh, a community, we wouldn't be having AA meetings here. And, this, and we do have 10 meetings a week in a small town, which we know is, is, is pretty uh, exceptional. So, Oh, and I wanted to mention to you, Lindsay, that it's called the meeting it's called the meeting guide app. And I, if I can find it, it's under, it would just, they can Google AA meeting app and it'll come up meeting guide. Okay. It's, it, it's coming out of AA in uh, New York, AA.org. And okay. we have a pretty uh, up-to-date AA of Utah.org uh, website for folks that are interested specifically in meetings in Utah and what's going on in Utah and AA. Our, our, our website is pretty current, Utah website. Okay. I just have uh, two more questions for you. One, for people who don't know exactly how AA works, what exactly is a sponsor? Is it just someone that's been in longer than you that kind of adopts you and helps you? Like, how does sponsorship work within AA? It, it uh, generally is not necessarily. Uh, most of the time, it's people that are uh, seem to have uh, their lives in order somewhat uh, that, that, uh, have something about them that's attractive. Uh, the uh, I, I sponsor people with with more sobriety than myself, uh, not because of anything other than the fact that it, I, I guess mostly that I'm willing to listen to them and, and try to give them some advice. I've had pretty su good success in being sober, uh, being in business, being married. All of those things play a factor in who who, who sponsors me. Um, my previous sponsor died in 2015. Uh, he had been sober for. 20 years longer than I was, but at the same time, he had been married long term, um, had a great relationship with his wife, uh, was a very active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So there was a lot of things about him that was very attractive. He was a businessman, advised me, helped me set up a business, start a business, advised me on how to run the business. So there were a lot more factors in it than just um, just the sobriety part of that. Uh, the, at the same time, he also he and I also, also talked a lot about the emotional impact of alcoholism, tra trauma that we've experienced because most people have had some trauma in their life that they don't want to address or haven't been able to address. Um, and so there's always something going on that, uh, that I need, I need a sounding board so that I can talk to someone uh, and, and get feedback that who's outside of my emotional circle. And, and really that's what my sponsor has been. Um, I, I trust him explicitly with my life basically. Uh, and I think that, uh, hopefully the people that I sponsor feel that way about me. Sponsors are um, 
members of, of the Alcoholics Anonymous who are uh, usually sober for a substantial period. And uh, we, we've already applied the principles, which are the 12 steps and traditions and concepts um, of Alcoholics Anonymous in our lives. I've had a sponsor since probably uh, six weeks after I got sober. And I uh, have been sponsored by several different women. My, my current sponsor is still in St. Louis. And um, I, I, I am talked to her somewhat, I, I, to be honest with you, fairly infrequently. Um, but I can call her. She was there when we first moved to Kanab. There was a, a situation that became pretty uncomfortable for me. And I'll never forget when it happened on a Saturday. And I didn't call her to a Sunday on, until Sunday. I was 25 years sober at that time. And her first question was, why didn't you call me yesterday? So it's, it's things that we can relate to and uh, she can remain objective and still helpful and loving and, and making suggestions uh, towards me and for me when uh, life happens. And, you know, life is messy and uh, sometimes not uh, easy to deal with. And people are the same way. And I, I was coming from a, uh, a culture in St. Louis that was uh, I'm not part of the dominant culture out here in Kanab. And it hit me in the face and uh um, figuratively, and uh, Donna was able to help me navigate that that situation and give me suggestions. And, uh, so I'm uh, just always grateful for the sponsorship, for the enthusiasm, and the oh, it's okay. Uh, let's let let's think about it. Maybe if we, we think about it differently. The, the the other thing is 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 that in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I was uh, we're, we're we're off the topic of sponsorship, but. I would not be able to be sober without uh, praying. I, I, I have a, a, a higher power that I choose to call God, but one can have a higher power uh, of one's own making. That's the, the joy of Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't tell you how to believe, what to believe. We we the, the, the big book encourages us to think that we do have somebody bigger and better than we do. And I uh, have a... Um, a, a lovely prayer life that's enhanced by Alcoholics Anonymous, because I know that uh, for me, uh, God's running the show, and it's re it's re I'm reminded of that when I go to my my meetings during the week, and I'm sitting across the room from somebody who was sober 24 years ago, and he's drunk, and the individual's drunk again, and I'm, I'm I, he 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 says I want to change my life, so it's a uh, it's a powerful program. It's a powerful program, but it's there's a lot of uh, some important details like sponsorship and the 12 steps that help me stay sober. Yeah. Thank you. I have one last question for you guys. What do I do if someone I love is struggling with addiction? You can contact uh, AA, uh, AA of Utah.org or just go AA um, and there's a uh, it's a couple of, uh, there's a lot of information online. There's a lot of PSAs, public service announcements that are online to uh, help individuals uh, try to help their um, loved ones or their friends. So AA, ha we have a lot of information out there and you can always find someone you, that people are welcome to call the, the Utah office in uh, Salt Lake. We have folks that answer it. We have a Dixie office in St. George. Folks answer that um, those um, telephone uh, numbers and those lines are readily available and folks are, are, are answering that 24-7. Uh, so uh, uh, information is available and either one of us would be glad to give out our phone numbers. We'd be glad to help anyone try to navigate the program of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or get to a meeting. On a, on a more personal level, if, um, if, if you have someone who's a, a, an alcoholism and, and addiction, the, there are sister programs, Al-Anon and um, NAA that, that are recommended for people that have family members or, our spouses or siblings or whoever uh, that they're emotionally attached to that are uh, having issues that, that they go to that. Uh, it will give you a way to separate yourself from their, from their addiction because um, the best thing I can, <laughs> the best thing my mom and dad could have done was nothing, but they tried to help me uh, and they did everything they could to help me. And I understand that today uh, they love me so much. It almost killed me uh, because they would, 
tell me I shouldn't be doing this, but then they would bail me out of jail, which almost gave me permission to keep doing it. So the less involved I get in the addiction of someone else, the better off I am and the better off they are because the less resources they have to fall back on whenever they're in the middle of it, the more apt they are to start looking at themselves and, and trying to make some changes. Sometimes the best thing that individuals can do for folks, their siblings or their friends is just leave them in jail. To be honest with you, just leave them there and let them. Um, we have a drug, a great drug court here in Kane County. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it isn't. But as Jim alluded to, there's Narcotics Anonymous meetings available readily uh, also in the state of Utah that can help folks with uh, uh, drug addiction issues. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your knowledge and information about AA. Is there anything else you want to add here at the end or want to leave us with your contact information I can put in the bio of the video? Anything else, last words you want to add? My, my phone number is uh, 314-750-3253. Women, women are welcome to call me. And Jim's number is? 314-750-8817. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Any and last wanna, words? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. we want to thank the, uh, you, the Utah uh, for my, family, my Family Law uh, for doing this and for uh, try, uh, helping people because it's, uh, it, it's just uh, uh, significant, a significant disease that eats up lots and lots of money, resources, and families yeah. and lives. So uh, I applaud you for this. I really do. So thank you for reaching out. I know you went the long way to get to us, but you went the way that is was uh, was through the uh, AA in, in New York and it got kicked down to what we call our delegates and they sent it to me because I'm the public information person. So the process did work and it, it was a, a real surprise, but thank you. This was a blessing for both of us to participate in this. It, it brings it home right in my, right to our, right to my face anyway. So thank you very much. I want to applaud the, the Utah family law service for doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much.